Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A new strategic plan to combat homelessness in the city is taking shape. The California-based nonprofit Home Base, hired by the city to develop that plan, says it is nearing the end of the information gathering phase. In just about two months, it's expected to present its recommendations to the city council. Garrett Berger talked with the deputy director of Home Base about what they've been doing so far. It's an issue on many San Antonians' minds. You got homeless people everywhere. You got people in the streets. You got people living under bridges. It's a big issue they need to address. They have to talk about it and they need to fix the problem. And it's an issue the three-person team from Home Base has heard a lot about from a lot of people since arriving in November. The providers, uh, state hospitals, criminal justice, all of the different intersections that this population meets with. There have also been chances for regular San Antonians to weigh in at public forums. Home Base Deputy Director Patrick Wigmore said themes have appeared through their research like coordinating existing resources. So ideas for how to institutionalize a lot of the relationships and build in warm hands off for individuals as they move through the system so that we can have good outcomes. Wigmore says San Antonio has been getting good outcomes from its services, but there's a growing demand for them, which is a nationwide issue. You have certainly have individuals who are experiencing homelessness. They go through the programs that are operating. They have successful outcomes, and then there's a whole other group of individuals behind them. After the final public forums, Wigmore and his team will turn their focus to developing the plan. In April, Home Base will present that plan, and the city has more than half a million in the budget ready to spend on it just this fiscal year. In regards to carrying out this plan, I mean, we're very serious about this. Which is good, because the plan is just that, a plan. But at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the community to implement it. If you're interested in providing your opinion on the homeless issue, the last two public forums are tonight and tomorrow at 6 p.m. Tonight's is at Palo Alto College, and tomorrow's is at the Elvira Cisneros Senior Community Center. You can find more details on our website, ksat.com. Live in the newsroom, Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. A family in New Braunfels now left without two children, one dead, the other behind bars about 830 Saturday night. Police were called to the 600 block of Sumner Circle after a gunshot wound victim was reported. New Braunfels police say they found 16 year old Gabriella Gabrielle Barrera shot to death. After conducting investigations at the scene, they arrested her brother, 17 year old Zachary Barrera and charged him with first degree murder, though they have not said why they believe he pulled the trigger. Neighbors are heartbroken over the loss. I talk to the dad. Um, he barbecues all the time, so do I. So, you know, we just say hi to each other when we, we go by. But I've, I've never heard any arguing or nothing from that house. I, so it's very surprising, you know. I see the kids often, you know, but I've never seen them angry or nothing. The Comal Independent School District, they say the deceased Canyon High School junior was involved in musical theater. That last check, her brother was in the Comal County Jail. His bond set at $250,000. A 24-year-old mother and her toddler son still recovering in the hospital after a fire tore through their home on Vista Loma Street in New Braunfels on Friday. Two other men were also sent to a hospital but later released. Stephanie Cerner reports some family members say that they now have nowhere to go. Jesus Sainz Jr. says he was staying in the garage on Friday morning when the fire broke out. My brother-in-law comes over there and knocks and says the house is on fire and I'm like, what? Come out and sure enough, it happened all in the house. He tells us while he wasn't hurt, his niece and her little boy are still in the hospital. My niece, she got burnt pretty bad. She was in critical, but she's going to be okay. Her son, Messiah, well, he burned his back his hand and his ear. More than a dozen people lived on the property. The New Braunfels Fire Department reporting that the property now is a total loss. We can't stay here. Yeah. I mean, Obviously. and they got all the power off and, you know, and I ain't got nowhere to go, so I'm packing my stuff and I don't know where I'm going. Fire investigators are now looking into what caused that fire, but they say they do believe it started in the front bedroom. Stephanie Serna, KSAT 12 News. Turning to other top stories, San Antonio police say four people were hospitalized following a shootout last night. Police say a man and a woman showed up at another couple's home in the 5800 block of Mid Crown near Eisenhower Road about 930 last night and began to argue with that couple. That's when the suspect started shooting. The victims were taken to the hospital where a man in serious condition, while police say a woman was shot in the leg, isn't expected to be and is expected to be OK. Both suspects also taken to the hospital. They're expected to survive. 
Police are now investigating whether they were shot by the male victim as he returned fire or hit by ricocheted bullets. The cause is still under investigation. Police have identified the victim in a fatal crash that happened on the west side over the weekend. Officers tell us Ruben Alejandro Cisneros was his car was slamming into a barrier wall yesterday morning when this wreck happened. Police say that Cisneros was speeding heading east along the 1400 block of Highway 90 near Zarzamora when this happened. He was pronounced dead there at the scene. No one else was hurt. It's not clear what caused this crash. The firefighters worked hard this morning to keep a fire from spreading from construction site to University Hospital, which is just a few feet away. That fire was called in around 530 this morning in the medical center area. Firefighters say they were flames shooting from the site and called for a second alarm due to the size of the building. They were able to keep the flames contained to the construction area, but they did do a check of the hospital afterwards just to make sure those flames didn't spread. As for the cause, firefighters say it was started during demolition work, possibly by a cutting torch. The job is pressure packed, complicated and sometimes educational. We're talking about court reporters, the person sitting alongside the judge during a trial, making a written record of every word spoken. Paul Venema takes us into the courtroom for a closer look at what is one of the most important jobs there. You see them in most every trial on TV, usually barely visible, sitting in front of the witness stand, quietly recording every word spoken for the record. We literally at the Court of Appeals could not do our job, but for your good job. Chief Justice Sandy Bryant Marion is talking about court reporters as she reads a proclamation from the mayor and city council designating this week in their honor. It is the reporter's job to produce an accurate written record of a trial or any legal proceeding that may need a record. We are writing on that little machine. We're writing everything everyone says. Not only that, um, we're also identifying the speakers and doing it fast. They must be able to write 225 words per minute. That's a challenge since most people speak at upwards of 300 words. Incredible amount of responsibility and incredibly hard because of different people in the way they talk. Trust me, I know, I speak very fast. My court reporter is a saint to deal with me. The job takes skill and training and requires certification. After all, there's a lot at stake, whether a criminal proceeding or a civil matter involving millions of dollars. It's a skill that has to be developed, and it might look easy, but it is not that easy to do. And it can be educational, since they're dealing with legal experts as well as experts in a variety of fields. It's interesting. Every day is different. Um, after 26 years, um, I still love it every day. Complicated and often challenging, it's not an easy job. But whatever the case, a court reporter always has the best seat in the house. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go to the TransGuide camera at I-10 and Loop 1604. You can see things are moving. Congested. But things are at least moving. This is looking at 1604 over I-10. Roads look a little damp out there. It's been gray, warm, and humid, but the warmth has just gone away, Adam. Those temperatures really dropped. Yeah, temperatures have taken a big hit outside. And that's because of a cold front that's pushing southward. And you can see the low clouds that are in place behind the cold front will have some dampness again through the night. But the main rainfall, that's going to be holding off for a bit longer. You head out to Lavaca County. That's where we've had really the only rainfall over the past hour or so, a little broken line of rain out there. And despite some dampness here the past couple of days, the aquifer is actually down a little, a tenth of a foot, but now three feet above the February average. Mold is high as a result of all the moisture in the air at 1700 and ash is moderate. Look at this temperature change. Compared to this time yesterday, the hill country is about 25 to 27 degrees cooler. Now, here in San Antonio, we're 17 degrees cooler. That cold front is making its presence known. We'll talk more about our better chances of rain and what the temperatures will be doing coming up. Thank you, Adam. They've defended our country. Now they're ready to help America in a new way. Military members transitioning into the civilian workforce can find it difficult to land jobs in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. But a new federal bill could change all that. Courtney Friedman takes us to Randolph Air Force Base, where there's a program that could soon get some much needed funding. Terry Burden served in the U.S. Air Force for 20 plus years, retiring in 2006. It was difficult for me uh, to transition out. However, going through programs such as the STEM or 
other programs the military offer, it helped me. So now every day he coordinates those same kinds of programs as a campus director for Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. The nationwide university has extended campuses focusing specifically on STEM education for transitioning military members. Microsoft runs and helps the government fund the campus at Randolph Air Force Base. The program teaches cloud application, cloud development, and cybersecurity. This program has two separate parts. From 8 a.m. to noon, they're learning the actual IT material. And then from 1 to 5, they're learning transitional skills for when they get into the civilian workforce. A resume writing, how to dress from wearing a uniform to wearing uh, the type of civilian clothes, the terminology that will be used from business owners and hiring officials. U.S. Senate Bill 153 would increase funding for programs like these. The Supporting Veterans in STEM Careers Act would make National Science Foundation programs available to veterans and coordinate with other federal agencies to boost similar courses. Representative Will Hurd showed support, saying, we live in a world where our military and economic dominance is no longer guaranteed. Guaranteed. To maintain our position as the leading global innovator, we must have enough creative problem solvers and leaders to fill jobs. The bipartisan bill passed both the House and Senate and now sits on President Trump's desk ready for a signature. Our military vets have so much talent, so much knowledge that they could give to the civilian sector. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. The Microsoft STEM program at Randolph has the capacity for about 20 students per class and counts for college credit. The top spots are saved for active duty members who will end their military service within six months. But all active duty members and veterans are encouraged to apply. We have the application details on our website right now at KSAT.com. Democratic presidential candidates pulling out all the stops in New Hampshire in a final bid to win voters who could sway the outcome of Tuesday's first in the nation primary. Details from the campaign trail coming up. Plus, how seizures associated with Alzheimer's disease could actually help researchers learn more about its progression. For years now, scientists who study Alzheimer's disease have acknowledged an increase in seizures in patients, but didn't focus much attention on them. That's changing. Ursula Perry shares some new information on how the frequency and the timing of those seizures may give researchers more insight into how this disease can progress. Scott and Susie Plakin had what Scott calls a fairy tale marriage. But after three decades and six children, the Plakins were dealt a crushing blow. Doctors diagnosed Susie with Alzheimer's. She was only 53. For several months, I couldn't even tell my kids that they were likely going to lose their mom in three to five years because Alzheimer's is fatal 100% of the time. He scaled back his legislative duties to care for Susie until her death in 2018. He says initially he had no idea what Susie would face, including those sudden dangerous falls. And I found her laying on her side in a seizure state with a pool of blood about this big coming out from, from her head and I didn't know what it was. What can happen in the patients with Alzheimer's disease is uh, essentially a change in the structure of their brain. Those brain and nerve cell changes can lead to seizures. Now, a study of 300,000 U.S. veterans over the age of 55 shows seizures were associated with twice the risk for developing dementia between one and nine years later. Dr. Laird was not involved in the newest research, but she says at the very least, clinicians need to carefully treat seizures and prepare caregivers. If the seizures are active enough and disruptive enough or put them at risk uh, to get hurt, uh, you have to kind of prioritize to that. Representative Plakin says every scientific finding may bring doctors closer to new treatments and someday a cure. And that's what I'm looking forward to that day. Representative Plagan continues to honor his late wife, Susie, by continuing to advocate for Alzheimer's research as well as awareness. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, this is a strange day. It is. Like, cut in two halves. Yeah, and now it's cold. <laughs> yeah, rainy this morning, 
and warm. I mean, we were in the 70s all the way yeah. oh, you know, yeah. around the noon hour. And then now we're down into the 50s and some areas in the 40s, just wide ranging temperatures. So very transitional, and that's because of a cold front that paid us a visit just a few hours ago here in San Antonio. So let's talk about it. We'll go through how much rain fell because, you know, we say did some downpours and not everybody got it. Some people just got a little bit of drizzle and that's it. Take a look at these rainfall totals actually measured. And Lost Maple State Natural Area, nearly an inch from a big downpour that's set up there with a storm. Medina, three quarters of an inch. That's in central Bandera County and even Canyon Lake, about a quarter of an inch. You get locally, Kelly Field actually didn't get any measured rainfall, just a trace there. Then you get up to Chavano Park, about a third of an inch. One little part of Stone Oak had about an inch of rain. Two rain gauges there in Stone Oak near each other had about an inch of rainfall, but then you go to Selma and only two hundredths of an inch. So a typical stratification with rain around here. But I do think we'll be filling those rain gauges quite a bit more uh, within about the next 36 hours. So let's talk about it. First temperatures and those changes. 47 in Kerrville and Comfort. Lost Maples at 45. 57 here in San Antonio. Just at 1 p.m. We were at 73 degrees. That was our high temperature for the day. But you go to Catula and it's 82 right now. Even Laredo at 84. So that warmer air is to the south of us, but this cold front is gradually progressing southward and temperatures are responding accordingly behind it. So 40s in the hill country, 80s as you head farther to the south. Pleasanton's at 62 right now. You recently had the front just over the past couple of hours and you've had that big temperature drop there. So for early tomorrow morning, for the rush hour around sunrise, we'll say 47 here in San Antonio and closer to 40 degrees in the hill country and some fifth, low to mid 50s elsewhere. Then by tomorrow afternoon, we don't see much of a temperature rise. We're thinking only 52 for the high temperature here in San Antonio tomorrow and only in the 40s in the hill country. So most of the day tomorrow will be spent right near 50 degrees. So definitely a much cooler and a chilly Tuesday. So. Tuesday, the high temperature only 52, and then we make it back into the 60s Wednesday, but overall near 60 Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So when you look at the temperatures for the rest of this week, we'll actually be running a little below average and definitely on the cool side. So have the jacket and the long sleeves ready to go day after day after day. Taking a look at the radar right now, we had a few showers develop in Lavaca County, just clipping parts of Hallettsville and flaring up a little bit just east of Hallettsville over the past two hours. But that's all we have to speak of right now. Otherwise, just some low hanging clouds and a little bit of drizzle. Good moisture across the state. And this is all because of the big upper level swirl, big upper level disturbance over Southern California and the Northern Baja Peninsula. That's throwing moisture our way and energy our way as well. Combine it with that cold front. We got some rain today. Let's go forward though. That upper disturbance is going to pass right overhead. So tomorrow through the morning, just some sprinkles, a little bit of drizzle. Same story at the noon hour and the afternoon. Overall, just a damp day tomorrow, but not a whole lot of real measurable rain. Then we get into tomorrow night. Notice that midnight Wednesday, that's when the rain starts to fill in a bit more. We get more widespread rainfall and even some good soakers out there, and that should give us a bit of a drought denting rainfall, I think, tomorrow night. Wednesday morning, still some lingering showers for the commute. Then we clear on out and we could see between half an inch to an inch of rain in some parts of South Texas. So there's a way to look at it. There are rain chances there Tuesday night into early Wednesday morning. That's when they spike. Otherwise, it's just going to be cool tomorrow, as I mentioned, right near 50 degrees. Uh, most of those days with those periodic showers, we do clear out Wednesday afternoon and then we're looking at nothing but sunshine for Thursday and Friday. Some good rain potential. Anyway. Looks like a little bit of a drought denting rain. Yeah. OK, thanks, Adam. Mm -hmm. All right, we know Pop will be the coach. Uh, talking about the U.S. Men's Olympics team for basketball. Yes, and now it looks like he's going to have most of the stars back with him. The 44 finalists named today. How many Spurs made that list for Olympic possible gold? And he's coming to the Valero Texas Open right now as their number one ranked player in the world coming up.
Spurs. San Antonio Spurs are in Denver tonight to continue their disastrous rodeo road trip so far that is now on a four-game losing streak and is on pace to match their worst rodeo road trip in franchise history. Last year, they went one and seven. But breaking that streak tonight will be a tall order when you consider the Spurs are now 22 and 30 overall. The Denver Nuggets just jumped up to second place in the Western Conference, just three games behind the best of the West, the LA Lakers. The Spurs have now lost to the Clippers, the Lakers, the Jazz, and most recently the Kings in Sacramento, where DeMar DeRozan was ejected late in the fourth quarter, arguing a foul call is only his second since joining the Spurs. That was a big loss when you consider DeRozan is averaging 23 points and shooting over 53% from the field. Now, here's a look at the latest Western Conference games before going into tonight's game. The Lakers, the Nuggets, the Clippers, Utah Jazz, and Houston are in the top five. The rest of the top ten look like this, including Oklahoma City, Dallas, and Memphis. That's where the line is drawn for the playoffs. Then it's Portland next at number nine, San Antonio at 10, 17 and a half games out of first. Team USA announced the 44 finalists who will have a shot at 12 roster spots for the U.S. men's basketball team that will try for a fourth gold medal at the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. And among the finalists are three Spurs and DeMar DeRozan, LaMarcus Aldridge, and Derek White, who did such a great job of filling in during the World Cup competition when a lot of the big names decided not to participate, resulting in a disappointing seventh place finish. But now superstars such as LeBron James are seriously considered playing this summer for no other reason, a chance to be coached by five-time NBA champion Greg Popovich, who is the new head coach of Team USA. The Baylor Bears are still the number one ranked team in college basketball. That's according to the latest Associated Press poll released today. And the Bears will put that number one ranking on the line tonight in Austin when they face the struggling Longhorns. That's because the Horns are coming off a 62-57 loss to the Texas Tech Red Raiders on Saturday and now drop to 14-9 overall and just 4-6 and six in the Big 12. Conversely, the Bears are 21-1 and one overall and undefeated at 10-0 and in the Big 12, suffering their only loss of the season way back on November the 8th. So here are the latest rankings according to the Associated Press. Baylor number one, followed by Gonzaga, Kansas, San Diego State, Louisville. The rest of the top ten looks like this. It includes Dayton, Duke, Florida State, Maryland, and Seton Hall. And two teams from Texans in the top 25 includes Houston at number 20, Texas Tech at 24. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Los Angeles Chargers and their star quarterback, Phillip Rivers, jointly announced today that the 16-year run with the team is coming to an end. That's because the most prolific passer in Chargers history will enter free agency next month at the age of 38. The eight-time pro bowler passed for over 4,600 yards, 23 touchdowns, with the fewest for him in 13 years, with 20 interceptions, and the Chargers finished 5-11 and last year in the AFC West. He finishes his career with the Chargers as the sixth in NFL history and career passing yardage with over 59,397 touchdowns. Now we wait to see who the Chargers go after. According to Las Vegas odds makers, they have the second best shot at signing Tom Brady if the six-time Super Bowl champ and the Patriots part ways in free agency, the first being the Las Vegas Raiders. Organizers of the Valero Texas Open are celebrating today. That's because Rory McIlroy, committed to play in the PGA Tour event here in San Antonio, just went number one again. That's right, Rory is now the number one golfer in the world. The last time he played, the JW Merritt Resort course was back in 2013, but now he's back in more ways than one. This is the eighth time he's been ranked in top of the world, and the first time since 2015. Now we wait to see if he can hold on to that mark until April the 2nd when the PGA Tour comes to San Antonio. But that is a huge get. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Monstrous. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. And still to come, we're heading to New Hampshire, where President Donald Trump is expected to hold a rally that he says will shake things up a bit. And the latest on the coronavirus, an entire cruise ship in Japan quarantined as dozens test positive for the virus. In less than 24 hours, voters in New Hampshire will head to the polls in the country's first primary. During the weekend, tensions reaching new highs as candidates sharpen their attacks against one another. ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi in Manchester, New Hampshire, with more. It is good to see. I the countdown is on for the first in the nation primary and the candidates not wasting a minute. Now it's decision time and it's coming down to this. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders getting an early start addressing a crowd of supporters at a breakfast in Manchester. We don't go to rich people's homes and get advice from millionaires and billionaires who are raising all kinds of money. You are my donors. Yeah. Sanders, who's currently leading the pack in the polls, reminding voters of his grassroots-funded campaign. 
on the other side of the state. We have a big thing tomorrow. My Senator Amy Klobuchar feeling a boost from Friday's debate pushed an optimistic message in the first of her four events. I don't have the biggest bank account in this race. Um, I uh, didn't have the biggest name ID going into this, uh, but what I have is grit. Senator Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden feeling the pressure to bounce back in New Hampshire after third and fourth place showings in Iowa. Biden shifting his criticism from Sanders and former Mayor Pete Buttigieg to President Trump. You know, Trump's going to tell us over and over again that the economy is on the ballot this year. It sure is. But something else is on the ballot. Character is on the ballot. The character of this country is on the ballot. Trump casting a shadow over the New Hampshire primary by hosting his own rally at the same arena Democrats filled just days ago. And down this street in front of the arena where President Trump will be holding his rally is a sea of red Make America Great Again baseball hats worn by the crowd already gathering at the front doors. And the president tweeting this morning that he wants to shake up the Dems a little bit. Mona Kosar Abdi, ABC News, Manchester, New Hampshire. Around America, also in New Hampshire, police are looking for a gunman who shot and injured three people near New England College overnight. Officials say a 911 call was made from an off-campus address. That's where officers found two women and one man injured. Police say two of the three victims are students at that college. Fellow students reacting to the news today. I looked out my window and I see like everybody just like running like so many people and they were just screaming like bloody murder and I was like oh my gosh like what happened it just sounded like a bunch of people left a party and I'm mean, just maybe a little bit louder mm -hmm. and they were just spreading out everywhere all the victims were treated for their injuries that were not life-threatening and then they were later released police haven't given any information about the shooter or shooters they said this is an ongoing investigation to Ohio now, where police are still investigating a shooting at a nightclub which killed three people early Sunday morning. Police in Youngstown, which is just southeast of Cleveland, say they do have at least one suspect in custody. The three victims were shot at the Brothers of Power Classic Car Club. One of them found shot to death in his car. The identities of the victims have not yet been revealed, but police say they were all men in their 30s. An Alabama man was arrested after police say that he pulled a gun and fired off a single shot because kids in his apartment complex were being too loud. No one was hurt here. Police say they heard a gunshot when they were responding to something else at that apartment complex Saturday night. Neighbors were told to stay inside and lock their doors. That order was lifted after the man was arrested. China reported a rise in the new coronavirus case today, putting a dent in any optimism that disease control measures, including isolating major cities, it might be working. This while the operator of a cruise ship in Japan reported dozens of new cases as well. ABC's Serena Marshall with the latest. Wearing a mask, Chinese President Xi out visiting a hospital, a community center, even having his own temperature taken. <laughs> An effort to reassure the public that Chinese government can handle the coronavirus. Even as thousands of new cases have been reported in China just today, seen a substantial increase from the weekend. Already the virus has killed more than 900 people and infected 40,000 worldwide. China instituting mandatory quarantines, a strategy President Trump supports, telling governors gathered to the White House, President Xi assured him that warm weather will kill the virus. Now, the virus that we're talking about having to do, you know, a lot of people think that goes away in April with the heat. The World Health Organization, though, not banking on the change of season, sending a team to China to help investigate the outbreak, as officials now worried the threat may actually be increasing. We have seen some concerning instances of onward transmission from people with no travel history to China. On this quarantined cruise ship outside Yokohama, Japan, confirmed coronavirus cases nearly doubling. There are uh, 66 additional positive cases of coronavirus bringing the total number of infected on board to 136. Rebecca Frazier is one of them, but while the coronavirus can be serious and deadly, so far the impact on Rebecca's health while in isolation in a Japanese hospital has been mild. It doesn't even feel like a cold, to be perfectly honest. I wouldn't have known that there was anything wrong with me 
um, if they hadn't tested me. The Japanese government is considering testing all 3,700 passengers and crew on the Diamond Princess, which would require them to remain aboard until results become available. Serena Marshall, ABC News, Washington. A new TV show based on last night's Best Picture winner is now on the way. Details on that project and more from Oscar night coming up in the buzz. All right, it's the time of the show where we talk about what's coming on coming up online at nine o'clock. We do the KSAT news at nine every night, Monday through Friday, and we're going to talk about a school district that is under investigation, but has new leadership under investigation, but under new leadership tonight. Yes, the Harlandale ISD superintendent sits down with us to talk about what it's been like taking over that role as superintendent in the midst of a Texas Education Agency investigation. He talks about the ways that he wants his district to move forward how they are still waiting for the state to say um, what the final results of that investigation may be. But he sits down with our Tiffany Huertas to explain, here's the allegations that district has been facing, but here's how he wants to see yeah. the district propel itself forward and while they wait for the TEA to decide. Amid all the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Also going to talk about Google. <laughs> Have it wonder something, you know, watching the Oscars last night. I wonder how old Jane Fonda is. Let's Google it. <laughs> Randy Newman. Google. Well, you all know, these things. there's a way that you can use Google to better your search results. If you're, okay. you've searched something, you've said, you know what, those results are not what I'm looking for. You may just be Googling incorrectly, basically. There are tips ah. and tricks out there of what to put in the search bar to help you get the best results. This is part of our adulting hack series. I'm actually really looking forward to I, this story. I didn't know there was a wrong way to Google. Apparently, there are better ways okay. to Google. How about all right. that? So all right. that's all coming up tonight at 9. Yeah, and we don't have to Google cooler weather, that's for sure. <laughs> Just go outside, Adam. Yeah, it's here, and it's going to be here for a good chunk of the week. You'll notice the lower temperatures. Right now, we're at 57 degrees here in San Antonio. Low clouds in place. You know, Pleasanton dropped about 20 degrees just over the last two hours. That's pretty impressive. That's because of the cold front that moved through. So down to 53 at 10 p.m. By 2 a.m., we'll be in the upper 40s, and I think we'll start the day tomorrow in the 40s across a good portion of South Texas. We'll talk more about what you can expect for the cold and damp weather tomorrow and some drought denting rain. We'll time that out for you coming up. All right, check this out. A historic collaboration between NASA and the Europe European Space Agency to study the sun. The solar orbiter deployed late last night from Cape Canaveral in Florida for its voyage around the sun. The spacecraft is designed to provide scientists with the first ever images of the sun's poles. The ESA director of science tells NASA, quote, by the end of our solar orbiter mission, we will know more about the hidden force responsible for the sun's changing behavior and its influence on our home planet than ever before, end quote. All right, in the buzz today, Parasite made Oscars history last night, becoming the first foreign language film to win Best Picture. It was one of four Academy Awards for the South Korean film, another being Best Director for Bong Joon-ho. In the acting categories, three of the recipients were first-time winners. You know, a lot of people thought Roma might win last year, and it would be the first, but no, Parasite. Joaquin Phoenix took home a statue for his role in Joker, as did Laura Dern and Brad Pitt in the actress and actor in his supporting role categories for Marriage Story and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And Renee Zellweger took home her second Oscar, her first in the lead category for her work in Judy. She's from Texas. Did you know that? I did. Katie. Katie, Katie right? area, I think. Right yeah. outside of Houston. Yep. Parasite's big wins at the Oscars is good news for the planned TV series based on that movie. According to The Hollywood Reporter, a limited series based on the dark comedy thriller has been in the works. The film follows two Korean families, one rich and one poor, and all that ensues when the poor family cons its way into the lives of the wealthier one. Director Bong Joon-ho is working with American director and producer Adam McKay to bring the proposed limited series to HBO that will expand on the film. Jong Bong Joon-ho talked to Extra Sunday night on the Oscars red carpet about the project. He said talks were in the very early stages and he would make sure they create a highly high quality limited series. I got to watch some of these movies. Still haven't. <laughs> I still think I think I think Knives Out was my favorite movie last year. Oh yeah. Didn't get enough recognition. Didn't see that one either. Yeah.
one day. Okay. Appropriate for today's weather, it is National Umbrella Day. Some fun facts here. The umbrella actually dates back more than 4,000 years. Primitive parasols were used in places like ancient <clears throat> Egypt and Greece to shield people from the hot sun. But the Chinese are credited with inventing the first umbrellas used for rain. Since then, the umbrella, Ella, Ella, a, 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 a. has been through many changes from its status as a stylish accessory in England to miniature folding umbrellas. It's all about staying dry. And out of the sun. That helps too. It does. Happy yeah. National Umbrella Day. Hey, back at you. <laughs> Actually, pretty good timing for South Texas it for It really an umbrella is. Day. Yeah, at least oh. it fits today yeah. for us. Yeah, you're right. And you'll want to have it within reach for the next couple of days. And I think uh, tomorrow night's a real time frame for a good drought denter to move in. Not a drought busting rain, but a good little hit to the drought and we'll be saying take that and the aquifer should get a good little drink of water as well. So let's talk about it along with our cool temperatures and look at this. Look at our almanac data. 73 degrees is our high temperature around 1 30 p.m. and our low will just continually update every hour as the temperature continues to drop. Look at the rainfall a third of an inch measured at the airport. We're 57 degrees right now. We were in the 70s earlier. Now we're in the 50s with a north wind at 13 and it's that north wind that's pushing in the colder and less humid air, drier, not as muggy conditions. So Bernie Stage Airfield 46, 48 Bandera, 47 Comfort and Kerrville, Canyon Lake and Bulverde at 50. Then you get farther to the south of town, Pleasanton is 60, but they've dropped about 20 degrees just in the past couple of hours. Catula 82, Laredo 84. Yeah, that's the cold front. The wind has shifted northerly in Catula. It's going to take a little while for your temperature temperatures to respond, but give it an hour or two and you're going to see a big steep drop in Catula. Gonzales at 54 degrees. They're on the backside of the front, but neighboring Victoria 74. So clearly a cold front over South Texas. It was really slow to get pushing southward and uh, progress southward, but it's been finally making some tracks and pushing pushing farther to the south behind that boundary. Look at the colder air. Abilene's 37, Lubbock 39, Amarillo actually at 31. And in the northern panhandle today, earlier we actually had a little bit of wintry precipitation, a wintry mix, and then even just some snow. That's where we had the colder temperatures. Around here, I don't think we'll be cold enough even going forward for any of that uh, wintry precipitation. But what's driving this is a big upper level swirl. And you see the showers around it stretching into parts of Arizona and Southern California. This is a big upper level disturbance. Tapping into the Pacific moisture, good energy. It's slinging our way and it's moving it toward us. And that's what's really helping to develop some rain here as we go forward. Yeah, we had the cold front today, but we also have this energy and we had some dampness yesterday as well as a result of this. Well, this is going to pass directly overhead and give us a better kick in our atmosphere tomorrow night. So let's look at our future cast and go through this slowly. 7 a.m. Another morning of dampness tomorrow, cold and damp drizzle, a few passing sprinkles periodically, but a gray day and that'll last all the way through the afternoon. No real good measurable rainfall expected during the day tomorrow. Then we get to tomorrow night. Notice midnight on Wednesday areas of rain start to fill in on the radar screen. This is when that upper support moves overhead and starts to generate these showers and even some good embedded downpours tomorrow night through about the morning drive on Wednesday. So the Wednesday morning commute, you'll want to have some extra time. It's going to be a damp one with like a ponding of water on some roadways. But then by Wednesday afternoon, that clearing line moves through and we'll actually have sunshine. As for rainfall potential, Right now it's looking like anywhere from about a half an inch to an inch for a good chunk of South Texas, but as usual, it's going to vary significantly. So we'll have to wait and see, but at least the potential is there for around an inch of rain. Tomorrow we'll start the day at 47, only make it to 52 in the afternoon. So cold and damp with those sprinkles and a little bit of drizzle. Jacket weather all day tomorrow. As we go into Wednesday, we'll have that rain tomorrow night through the first part of Wednesday morning, then it's going to be a sunny and nice afternoon in the 60s, but a north wind is just going to dominate the rest of the week. So despite sunshine, Thursday and Friday will only be near 60 in the afternoons and mornings in the 30s. So feeling a chill this week and then yeah. warming up for the weekend a little bit. Yeah, back bit. to 70 yeah. degree mark roughly. All right. Thanks, Adam. Mm -hmm. In case you missed it coming up next.
Good morning. It is Monday, February 10th. One teen is dead, another is in serious condition after a crash. Police say only one car crashed while on Loop 410 near Old Pearsall Road. Police have not been able to give us much information due to the ongoing investigation. San Antonio investigators are looking into a late night shooting on the northeast side of town. San Antonio police say it all started when a man and a woman showed up at another couple's home on 500 block of Mid Crown, that's near Eisenhower Road. Shots were fired soon after the suspects left the scene, called EMS at a home on Woodcraft. The victims in their 30s were transported to Samsey, where the man remains in serious condition, the woman in stable condition. Both suspects were picked up and transported to University Hospital. They're in stable condition. When we arrived, we could see an active fire. We did call for a second alarm, obviously because of the size of the structure. That fire was in a fenced off construction site on Medical Drive, just outside University Hospital's doors. Firefighters quickly responded to the 5.30 a.m. call and got to work. What they did not have to do was evacuate any patients. They were able to keep the flames, which broke out in an unattached and out of use skywalk contained to just that area. If you've been watching The Bachelor this season, you know it's been uh, quite the bumpy ride. So far, a lot of that drama centered around a contestant right there from San Antonio. Our producers, Joy Presley and Ariana Cervantes, spoke to Pilot Pete. They're huge Bachelor fans. They struggled to keep their cool when they interviewed he was over. Check out the reaction caught on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them are married, by the way. Damp and cold tomorrow. Not a whole lot of real rainfall, just drizzle and a few sprinkles throughout the day, but only near 50 degrees most okay. of the day. Then good rainfall tomorrow night. Sunny then by Wednesday afternoon for the rest of the work week. All right. Thanks for watching the news at six. See you back here on the night beat at 10 and of course online at nine.